Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> we're, we're blessed to have Luke and Jade here with us again. Uh, we'll just open up with some prayer. Uh, Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather and uh, for uh, Luke and Jade being here. Keep them safe as they travel back and uh, just open up our hearts and um, that we would worship you freely, Lord, and without, uh, without restraint, just letting it all down for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
that day when I see all that you have for me when I see you face to face there surrounded by your grace all my fears swept away in the light of your embrace where your love is all I need and forever I am free where the streets are made of gold in your presence healed and told let the songs of heaven rise to you Oh, my heart. 
All right, good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to Living Water and happy Valentine's Day. Oh my goodness. You know, it's really interesting that the Bible says God is what? A lot of things, right? But love permeates the character of who God is. It is God's love and mercy and grace that is so radical in our faith. It means that God loves you regardless of the mistakes you've made. Now, I know with our spouses, that's kind of hard to do sometimes. Or with our children, it is hard to do. If I was going to give the message a title today, it would be from a Pat Benatar song. <laughs> Love is a battlefield. How many of you can identify with that? Love is a battlefield. And I'm not talking about you're fighting your spouse. I'm talking about you fight for your spouse. You fight for your children. You fight for your church family and your family and your neighbors. And that is the battle because I can assure you the enemy is trying to split you up. He's trying to divide the church. He's done a great job. He's trying to divide marriages and divide families, and we must fight to love. And sometimes it's hard. I love faith, family, fellowship, friends, and freedom. Aren't you glad we're free? Ah, amen. Amen. Most, the most often used analogy in the Bible for Christians is soldiers or language about fighting the good fight, about persevering, about enduring to the end or standing fast. A lot of the terms related to Christians in the church are military terms that Paul employed. Make no mistake about it, we are living in enemy territory. That's why we're told to armor up, and we went over that maybe a month ago, the armor of God. And we're told to fight the good fight and keep the faith and endure and stay the course and run the race, which we talked about last week. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Christ made a statement about the church. It's the first time the word ecclesia was used, and we read it last week, but I want to read it again. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, will not overpower the church. What does that imply? Usually gates surround your kingdom. And if you are expanding your kingdom, your gates move, but the remnant bride of Christ those satanic territory, we know the world's going to become eventually all uh, under the Antichrist rule. Satan is the, the god of this world, Jesus told us. And when he was tempted, Satan said, if you bow down to me, Christ, I will give the world back to you. We know Christ doesn't retake the world back till the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation, where it says the angel blows and it says, now the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Christ. And he will reign. Until then, we live in enemy territory. And believe me, the enemy is trying to destroy you, trying to destroy your marriage, trying to destroy your family, and trying to destroy Bible teaching churches. Oh, compromised churches he really doesn't care about. Because they're already <laughs> teaching what he wants to be taught. We've all read this a hundred times, but in the last days, turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 1. You know, sometimes I watch the news and I'm shocked about the state of our world, about the state of our great nation that was once established on the Judeo-Christian ethics of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy, 
unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. Avoid such men as these. I want you to look at this list. I can assure you this, the enemy is trying to make these qualities part of who you are. That's why even in Christian marriages, so many end in divorce. Why? Because they're unloving. What does it say? Unholy, irreconcilable. Folks, if there's one thing that we need to be about in this Valentine's Day, remember, we need to be about loving those around us. But the fact of the matter is, love is a battlefield. I was going to sing the Pat Benatar version of that song, but you don't want to hear that. <laughs> love is a battlefield. <laughs> we folks have to fight for truth. We have to fight for our families. And we need to armor up and battle and contend for the faith, as Jude told us. We have to fight our flesh every day and take every thought captive, as Paul told us, told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. He said, we're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to obedience to Christ. That means as you battle to love your family, to love your spouse, to love your church family, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself, all the weird emotions that come up, all the weird thoughts that come up, you take them captive to obedience to Christ. That's part of the battle for love, where love is a battlefield uh, that we need to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting at verse 13, it says, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. All four of these imperatives are military terms. And folks, I need to again remind us that love is tough. You know, that's why so many people grow bitter against people they should be loving to, even in the church where we should be loving those in the church. Have you ever seen the enemy come in and just divide? We need to stand strong. Remember God told us this year, 2021, we're going to need three things to be victorious. Who remembers what those are? <laughs> Faith, humility, that's strength under control, and zeal for the things of God, to be zealous, to be passionate. And folks, part of that zeal is to be passionate for your spouse, for your children, for your church family. For when one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we rejoice with them. And we need to be passionate, zealous people. We need to be on fire for God and not lukewarm like the church of Laodicea, who was lukewarm, and what did Christ say? I'm going to spew you out of my mouth unless you repent. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, you don't have to turn there. It says, who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? You know, I love that. This is a promise. By the way, every promise in Scripture is provisional. What do I mean by that? It's a contract. God says, if you do this, I will do this. If you don't do this, I will do this. That was part of the old covenant, and it's still with us in the new. If you are zealous for what is good, who is there to harm you? Because you're passionate for the things of God. Zeal literally means determination. And if we find ourselves lukewarm this morning, it's time to get right with God and get zealous for the things of God and the church. 
It takes determination. Believe me, it's not determinism. Do not say, hey, I, 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 I can't do anything. God made me this way. I'm German, so I lose my temper. Don't every... <laughs> doesn't everyone say, I'm Italian, so I'm hot-headed. <laughs> you know, uh, we all say that. Folks, you need to determine in your heart and take every thought captive to love your spouse, to love your family, to love your church family. It is a battle. In fact, love is a battlefield. It takes faith. It's not just fate. Folks, every day we wake up and we make a choice. I'm going to love my spouse like Christ loves the church. I'm going to love my children like God the Father loves me. I'm going to love my neighbor as I love myself. And you need to determine that every day and make right choices to be pleasing to God so his blessings will be poured out on your life. In Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 15, we all know this. It's the Great Commission. You know you're all commissioned officers in God's army? Think about that for a minute. Are you behaving like a commissioned officer in the army of God? Are you behaving like an ambassador of Christ with diplomacy and nobility? Our commission is quite clear. Mark chapter 16, starting at verse 15. And he said to them, go into some of the world and preach the gospel. No, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Folks, that is what we need to be all about. Verse 16, and he who believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who disbelieved shall be saved condemned. And we know that our commission is our primary task. Folks, we're commanded to go out and share the gospel and God's love with a lost and hurting world. I tell you this, if you have the love of God in your heart, when you drive down the street and see someone lost, or you walk into a store and the Holy Spirit prompts you to share the gospel with them, you should love them to the point that you care about their eternal soul. And you want to go out. And that love makes you articulate the gospel. In Romans chapter 10, verse 12, starting there, you can turn there. Romans chapter 10, verse 12. It says, For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, we, what we could say there is between Jews and the world. Remember, Romans is a letter all about, hey, Jews, God no longer just chose you. He's chosen the whole world. The gospel is open to Gentiles as well. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For anyone who calls on him, God blesses as they seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Verse 13. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love that. We need to remind ourselves salvation is simply John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But from that that infancy, that childlike faith, we grow into mature believers, into soldiers in God's army and ambassadors of his kingdom, and we grow in the knowledge of the Lord. And we fight the good fight. Continue on, verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Folks, all of us here are ministers. And it is my job, the Bible says quite clearly, to equip the saints, you guys, for works of ministry. 
And our number one ministry is our commission. It's going out and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you can't say the words, or you're incredibly shy, carry a track in your pocket. Write, write my name and phone number on the back and say, hey, read this when you get a chance. It might change your life. And if you have any question, here's my pastor's phone number. Or if you want to talk to him, write your phone number. Hey, if you have any questions, here's my number. You see, you just planted a seed. I remember one time I was against tracks. Uh, we were passing them out in an evangelism class. The year was 1981. And we were passing them out at, I think it was an Ozzy Osbourne concert in the parking lot, right? Okay, <laughs> you know. And so we're passing out these tracks, and a lot of people just, like, flip this off and cussed at us. And, but some people would take the track. And I just thought, this is meaningless. This, this isn't going to impact anybody's life. You know, they're going to take that track. They're going to throw it away. And I'm just standing out here getting cussed at and flipped off. And I really didn't want to be there. I had a real bad attitude. These were tracks that we had to print up ourselves. So we wrote the track. And what we said is, hey, I wrote this. This is personal to me. Would you put this in your pocket and read it when you get home tonight? Or read it tomorrow when you have a quiet time. And if you have any questions, here's a, a, a pager number. You can reach me. <laughs> Remember, we, only, we didn't have cell phones back then. The next day, I get a call, late afternoon. And, and the voice was shaking, but, but happy. I could hear happiness. And this girl said, I got hooked up on heroin. And I've been selling my body. My dad is a Costa Mesa police officer. I'm living on the streets. And I remember I got to some guy's home from the concert, and he passed out. And something told me to reach in my pocket. And I found this piece of paper, and I read it. And I gave my heart to the God, and I immediately was sober. And God has delivered me and changed my life. I need help. We got to help this girl. You never know that one word when you proclaim the gospel to someone that's hurting, how it could change the course of their life. That one track that you pass out. I remember another time we had been on a long fast. I think it was 20 days. And we were about to break it. I didn't know how to break fast right, so we were going to Benny Hanna's. <laughs> we were going to pig out. Man, my toes were like, we're driving there. I'm like, we get to eat. We get to eat. Hallelujah. You know, and a car drove by, and God clearly told me. And th it wasn't audible. It was like an original thought stream. Like, it, it was like, you need to let that person know that I love them. And I'm like, there's no way. We're going to Benny Anna's, you know. And I'm driving, and it was like clear I had to do it. So my buddy, I'm like, keep an eye on that car. I flip a U-turn, throw my Bible on the dash, uh, because she's going to see two guys chasing her. <laughs> and I'm following this car and flashing my lights and honking and waving, and I held up my Bible, and finally she pulled over. And I walked up, and she cracked her window, and I said, I don't know what's going on, but God literally stopped us in our tracks and wants you to know he loves you. He loves you, and he's got a plan and a purpose for your life. I didn't know this lady. I didn't know what she believed. She started crying. She goes, I just left the pharmacy with the pills that I was going home right now to kill myself. And I had prayed, God, if you're real, please show me before I kill myself. She gave her heart to the Lord. I want you guys to know, as ambassadors of Christ, your life should be the greatest adventure. Everyone that you actually make eye contact with, you need to ask yourself, Lord, do I need to go share the gospel with that person? 
Sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, no, no, you don't have to. And you keep going. And just, Lord, just draw them to you. But often, the Holy Spirit will prompt you. Have you ever felt that? Don't, you don't raise your hand, but that prompting of the Spirit to go share God's love and forgiveness and grace and mercy with a lost and hurting person. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How will they call on Him in whom they have not heard or believed? And how will they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without you? Without me? It is a great commission indeed. It is a demonstration of love. Love for the lost and the hurting in this world. A love that should permeate every ounce of who we are, where our lives are no longer lived for self-preservation and self-love and accumulating all our creature comforts that we want, our lives begin to be lived to bless others, to reach out. I can assure you this. The promises of God are true. The more you pour into other people, the more God pours into you. You know, when I counsel people that are depressed, and I mean clinically depressed, like suicidal depressed, my first question is, if they're believers, how are you serving the Lord? What, what are you do, doing to serve others? You know what the answer always is? I'm not. I don't do anything. What do you do at church? Do you help the setup team? You help clean up the parking. How are you serving your neighbor? How are you serving and pouring into people? And inevitably, those that are clinically depressed, almost always, it's like, I'm not doing anything. I can barely keep myself alive. And I said, that's the problem. And usually encourage them, depending on their gifting and what they can do, and go with them. Maybe it's visit people in a nursing home and pray with them. Of course, nowadays with COVID, you can't really do that. <laughs> but you can get online and minister to people online and get on blogs and serve that way. But we need to be about fulfilling the Great Commission. I want you to know that God knew that we all would be living in these crazy days. And he has equipped you to be able to do great things for his kingdom in the midst of COVID, in the midst of the craziness and divide in our country. God knew that we would all be a part of this little church, Living Water, that we would form the body of Christ here and that all of us are important and each and every one of you, when you hurt, we hurt. When you rejoice, we rejoice. God knew your job situation. He knew the battles that you're facing, and I can assure you, he will equip you and strengthen you and empower you to be victorious in whatever battle you're facing this morning. Remember Esther. You can turn there if you want. It's just one verse. You don't have to, though. It's Esther chapter 4, verse 14. And we all know this. He said, Esther, if you remain silent at this time, note this, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. I want you to note this. I believe God has great blessings and great ministry for all of us here to do. And it might be just talking to one person what, that changes the course of their life. But if you don't do it, God will raise someone else up to do it, like he told Esther. If you remain silent, hey, God's going to use someone else, and you and your father's house will perish. Note this. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, God has you there for a purpose. Your mission field is where you work. 
It's where you live. We don't have to go to Africa, believe me. There are people right next door to you that have never heard the real gospel of Jesus Christ. As a fire department chaplain and hospice chaplain, when tragedy strikes, I've, I've gone into homes. This one um, younger guy had a daughter. She was six, and another, I think she was 13. He committed suicide. And I'm there, just ministry of presence, weeping with them. And, and I said, do you mind if we pray? And I'll never forget a 13-year-old girl in Ladera Ranch said, what is that? She didn't even know what prayer was. She had never heard the gospel. Folks, we have a great mission field all around us. God will empower you to go out and be his witnesses and ambassadors, to stand for truth in these crazy times where you can't hardly trust anything that you read or hear on television, to stay the course, to fight the good fight, and to keep the faith. As Christians, we're compared to soldiers who discipline themselves and have courage to fight the good fight. We're compared to athletes, like we talked about last week, to obey the rules, our coach, our captain, and to go out and do great things for him, for his glory. As ambassadors with dignity and nobility and uh, evangelism and diplomacy, we go out and represent Christ. And as royal priests in holiness and love and critically important sound doctrine, we minister to those around us. But the greatest thing we are called to be in the Bible is lovers. In fact, John chapter 13, starting at verse 34, Jesus said, A new command I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. For by this all men will know that you are my disciples." if you have love one for another. So this morning, the message on this Valentine's Day is really quite simple, yet foundational to who we are as believers. How's your love life? And I'm not talking about sex. I'm talking about demonstrating God's love to a lost and hurting world. Are you known as a lover, as someone who demonstrates God's love to those around you? In Matthew 24, Jesus gave us some signs of what the last days would be like. If you want, you can turn there. Matthew 24, starting at verse 9. And it says, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, note this, verse 12, most people's love will wax cold, will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The end he's talking about there is the rapture. That's why Paul in Corinthians wrote, hey, Christ will confirm you to the end blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, starting with the rapture of the church. It's the end of the church age. The commission is for us. But note this, what scares you most from this list? He says you're going to be delivered to tribulation. He says that you may be killed for your faith. Christ said that you'll be hated by all nations that many people will fall away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
that you'll be betrayed and hated by those who fall away from the faith. And that most people's love will grow cold. You know, I often tell people, especially when I'm witnessing to atheists or agnostics, they blame God or try to blame God for all the peril in this world. And I always say, you know, if the whole world would simply obey the Bible that says love your neighbor as yourself, Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. If we all really did that, we wouldn't have the problems that we have in life today. The thing that scares me most in this list is not tribulation. Christians are experiencing that all over the world today. It's not martyrdom. Gosh, when we, go, when we die, we go straight to heaven. You know, <laughs> I don't fear that at all. I do fear pain. I, I will preface that. Yeah, I don't like pain. <laughs> but martyrdom, no, just shoot straight. You know, if, I, if I'm going to die, do it, do it quick. You'll be hated by all nations. I don't fear that. Many will fall away from the faith. That, that grieves my heart, but I don't fear it. We knew it was going to happen in these last days. You'll be betrayed by those that fall away and hated. Well, you know, they're going to hate me because I'm going to correct them and they'll leave. (laughs) Most people's love will grow cold. That scares me. Because as you look around at our world today, you can see most people's love is growing cold. Oh, they have a fake love. It's not real love. Usually it's an emotion. Usually it's a, a warm fuzzy, or that's what they define as love. Love is defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and is radically different than that. On Valentine's Day, we must remember, love is a battlefield. We need to fight for our family, to fight for our church family, to fight for those around us that are going to burn in hell if we don't have the courage to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. First John chapter 5, verse 2, John wrote, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Folks, in the days ahead, we need to camp on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to end with a look at the church of Ephesus. You know, this is one of the most amazing churches. We just finished studying the book of Ephesians on our Thursday night study on Zoom. But Ephesians chapter 1, and you don't, you, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to pick out several verses from Ephesians. You can write them down and read them later if you would like. Chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. The church of Ephesus was known for its faith and its love. What's the trifecta for Christians? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As he goes through, if you do all these great things but do not have love, you are what? A gonging symbol. You're, you're, it's worthless. And then he defines love. Love is patient, kind. Doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It's forgiving. It focuses on the good, not the bad. Man, the church of Ephesus, oh, and it ends with our trifecta, sorry. Faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest of these is love. Church of Ephesus was known for its faith and its love for all the saints. Verse 17 of chapter 3 in Ephesians. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love 
It becomes who you are. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love. And by the way, walk is how you live your life. It's who you are. Let your life be known by its love. Just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And Paul ends his letter to the Ephesians with chapter 6, verse 24. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love. Incorruptible there literally means pure, unending. It's actually applied to immortal, incapable of being corrupted or changed. Paul ended his letter to Ephesus with this. Hey, let your love, grace to you, if you love Jesus with a love that is never-ending and uncorrupted. In the book of Revelation... We find that they were doing a great job. You can turn there if you want. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. And it says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. What are those again? The stars are the angels to the churches or messengers. And the lampstands are the churches. Okay. This is Jesus who walked among them. Verse 2, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and are not and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. This sounds like a great church. Ah, but the next verse kind of scares me. The next two. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. You know, the church of Ephesus was doing everything right. But the one thing they failed at was leaving their first love. Today is the day, this Valentine's Day, to rekindle our love for God and the Lord Jesus Christ. To get back to that wonder, that sense that, wow, the Bible, God wrote this to me it has words of life that he loves me so much and he pours into me as I love those around me and he blesses me today's the day to rekindle that first love to fight for our spouse and our family and our church family and even our neighbors even the ones that you don't like you still got to love them (laughs) <laughs> you know it's so important and by, this is the last verse we're going to read worship team you can come on up Matthew chapter 5 verse 21 you can turn there it says you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to burn in fiery hell. I don't know about you, but I think I'd rather obey the Ten Commandments than the way Christ interpreted this. It's easy for me not to go out and murder somebody, but oftentimes I hate or I call people stupid names. Under my breath, I don't say it out loud. <laughs> uh, well, Scott, maybe I have once or twice. 
Verse 23 of Matthew 5. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering, the next verse, at the altar, you come to church, you bring your tithes, you come to church to worship God and to give your offering to the Lord. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, note this, leave church. What does he say? Verse 24, leave your offering there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Folks, we need to be known for love and forgiveness and grace and mercy. Amen? Uh, Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would just rekindle Lord, and everyone here and everyone watching and online, God, I pray that you would rekindle that that first love that they had with their spouse. Lord, that you would rekindle love for their family members and love for their friends and church family. Lord, that we would be known as lovers. God, I pray that you would remove any bitterness, that you would heal hurts from the past. God, that you would replace hatred with a pure love that flows from your throne into us and out to those around us. And God, I lift up, Lord, those that are struggling today, those that are single, God, those maybe that have divorced or are in the midst of a divorce. God, I pray that you would comfort them and hold them in your loving arms. God, for the single people, I pray that you would prepare that right soulmate, God, that right person that they could marry and share their life with. And Lord, in the meantime, help them not to look in the wrong places. But Lord, we pray that you would bring them that right person, that will be a perfect complement, Lord, to their lives. And Lord, we pray that you would heal marriages. And most importantly, God, I pray that you would kindle in us that childlike faith and deep love for you, that we love you so much that we want to please you, where it's not burdensome, where your yoke is easy and your burden is light, because we love you so much. Father God, fill us with your Holy Spirit and that sweet love, joy, and peace that only comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
You know how God speaks in stereo, right? So any of you on Ross's text where he sends out that verse in the day? Well, that, that's the verse that God put on my heart to end the service with today. Just listen to this. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another, and do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Father God, again, we thank you, Lord, that you love us. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would give us the ability to love the way you want us to love and to fight for our marriages and our families and our church. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week and have a wonderful Valentine's Day. And we'll see you Thursday night at the Zoom meeting. The login's on your handout. Or, uh, or for uh, college and career age, uh, we meet here Fridays at 7 o'clock, and Scott uh, teaches an incredible study. So college and career Fridays right here. Kyle at 7 o'clock. <laughs> ah, yeah, there you go. And uh, Chris, and uh, God bless you. See you next week.